WLIW-FM In Conversation, our special program that brings you dynamic voices from across our region and beyond. Welcome to a special edition of WLIW-FM's In Conversation on food insecurity during a time of great need across Long Island. First, we'll hear from Paul Pachter of Long Island Cares, then a hyper-local perspective from Holly Reichert Wheaton of Springs Food Pantry. Our guest is Paul Pachter, President and CEO of Long Island Cares, the Harry Chapin Food Bank. Thank you for being with us, Paul. Thank you. It's my pleasure. A little note on, on numbers before we begin here, because sourcing information is very important, and I want to encourage folks to know theirs. I got all numbers for this chat <laughs> from Feeding America, and they can be they can all be found on the Long Island Cares website. Statewide, more than 2.4 million New Yorkers classify as food insecure, with one in four adults here on Long Island facing food insecurity. That's 221,000 Long Islanders whom are food insecure, and 65,000 of those Long Islanders are children. Can we talk about these numbers and how the pandemic, as well as skyrocketing food costs, have impacted the numbers of people whom are relying on organizations like Long Island Cares to get along? Well, of course, first of all, uh, the COVID pandemic resulted in about 400,000 more people needing food assistance during the pandemic. Uh, People were out of work. People were home from school. Those children who rely upon the free or reduced school meals program uh, really didn't have access to them, uh, although some school districts did mobilize to provide food for the children. You know, we were, to, you know, at Long Island Cares, we're, we're talking about over 2,000 seniors who needed our support, uh, almost 2,000 veterans who needed our support, uh, and over 900 homeless individuals who were living on the streets. So the pandemic brought uh, the need up by close to 72%. And Unbelievable. What, what we were able to do with the support of local and state governments was to open up 25 temporary pop-up distribution sites throughout Long Island. So we were able to feed people uh, where they are, as opposed to having them come to the pantries uh, and the soup kitchens at the time, because like everything else, uh, they were closed. But food banks, as you know, uh, are an essential service. And during the pandemic, uh, I think we did some of our best work. And sadly, you know, maybe there was a hope that uh, as the situation, the public health crisis eased or ended, that those numbers would go back down. But Paul, did they? No, uh, much to our surprise, uh, they didn't go down. And as you mentioned Uh, A minute ago, uh, the cost of goods right now uh, in the country and certainly on Long Island are up by about 35 to 40 percent. So those people that needed to go to the local supermarket or the corner grocery store were paying more. And in the past year, year and a half, we've seen about a 38 percent increase in the number of people who are coming to the emergency food programs here on Long Island uh, needing some assistance. You know, there are families that need some support, you know, if you have fresh produce or if you have, uh, you know, chickens or other proteins in your freezer, they need that, eggs, milk. Uh, Other people needed everything. Mm -hmm. So most of our agencies right now are seeing increases, you know, above 30 percent, close to 40 percent. And we haven't even touched on housing and what that's been doing. Absolutely. Sure. So, you know, our costs have gone up to purchase food. We Mm. purchase most of the food we distribute. And so uh, families continuing to struggle. You know, you mentioned housing. Uh, That's one aspect where people are having uh, great challenges, Uh, certainly uh, accessing health care is taking its toll on families that may be economically marginalized. So it's a big challenge right now that we're seeing. So while we're on this issue, can you talk about how disproportionately uh, food insecurity affects some sects of communities uh, over others? Well, you know, 
you would anticipate that uh, people who live in a low economic uh, situation in, in communities are struggling more than those that uh, may not be living in economically challenged communities. But when you look at food insecurity on Long Island, it really impacts a very diverse group of people. You know, 26% of the people that are visiting Long Island CARE satellite programs are people that are working, holding Mm -hmm. down two, three jobs, just trying to get by. Uh, Others who, you know, rely on government entitlement programs such as the SNAP program or Medicaid and Medicare, uh, they're struggling even more in terms of making ends meet. But if you look at the demographics of Long Island, uh, there is no difference between food insecurity in Roosevelt or food insecurity in Riverhead. It's, you know, just impacting everyone. And, uh, you know, we have to be able to address this in the most comprehensive way that we can. And that's where the public comes in. I'm glad you mentioned SNAP because, you know, 41% of food insecure people in Suffolk County are not eligible for nutrition assistance, 34% in Nassau County. Can we talk about current limitations to such programs that lead uh, more than 63,000 Long Islanders to not have enough support mm-hmm. to put food on the table. Well, you know, the problem with the SNAP program from uh, my perch that I have is really that the eligibility criteria uh, for the SNAP program really is not equal in terms of the various regions of the country. In other words, If you're eligible for SNAP, let's say, in Biloxi, Mississippi, it's no different than the eligibility if you live in Brookhaven, Long Island. Huh. So if you— And costs are quite different in those places. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're a family of four uh, and you're eligible for SNAP because your annual income is $51,000, the family in— Biloxi, Mississippi, who's earning $51,000, is not living in poverty. But on Long Island, they are. Right. So for years now, we have been trying to advocate and encourage Congress to regionalize the national poverty line. So in other words, if you know $51,000 cuts it in Mississippi, it may take $73,000 to cut it in New York. And that is the only way we're going to level the playing field and rise people up if you give them the kind of benefits they need. You know, during the pandemic, as you mentioned, people were getting $90 a month additional SNAP benefits. As soon as the pandemic was over, they lost that $90 or that, you know, $80. And that's what's driving people to the pantries, the fact that they don't have enough SNAP benefits to feed their family for an entire month. And many families and individuals who rely on the SNAP program, usually by the end of the second week of the month, they've expended all the benefit. Let's talk about food insecurity and how it mentally and physically affects those faced with it. It can be devastating. You know, you look at a senior citizen, someone in their, you know, 80s, 90s who are living alone, Uh, maybe lost uh, their lifelong partner, they're struggling. You know, they're dealing with isolation. You know, during the pandemic, that was so elevated with seniors, you know, feeling as if they couldn't go out, they couldn't see their friends, they worried about their health. Because that was a big, I mean, uh, you talk about the, the isolationist part of the pandemic, which obviously we all felt, Mm -hmm. but seniors were extra yeah, uh, affected because it was s- separate ourselves from our senior people to save their lives. Sure, they had to do that, you know, because first of all, our seniors were susceptible right. to the virus more than people who were younger in age. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were very, very fearful because many of them don't have a social support system. Their children, you know, moved away from Long Island. They're living in other states, so they really couldn't turn to their kids to help them out. So it was important to turn to those organizations 
uh, that support them. And Long Island Cares during the pandemic was delivering food to every senior citizen's home that we knew because they couldn't come out. They didn't want to come out. Right. And so we went to their home. You know, there were people who are uh, at home who are ill, they're bedridden, and they can't get to a local pantry. So we visited their homes as well. And then, you know, families with children, they were concerned about school, about the education and how their children would, you know, be able to, you know, achieve what they needed to achieve. And, you know, what do you do with a child that doesn't have a laptop, that doesn't have a tablet and is unable to keep up with the rest of the class that has the technology? So there were many, many challenges that people saw uh, and that, you know, organizations such as ours had to... uh, you know, reconfigure what we were doing. We were available to people seven days a week during the pandemic if needed. Uh, And, you know, to see an additional, you know, 400,000 people, those numbers were completely off the charts uh, here on Long Island. And, you know, the good thing about it, if there's anything good about it, is that people realize that on Long Island, at least, the average family is one paycheck away from needing the services of a food bank. That's right. Just to touch on this for a moment, which I guess we can talk about it more. Uh, good, nutritious food in one's body or mm-hmm. uh, uh, very uh, affects one's body and brain mm-hmm. enormously. Yeah. So let's talk about the good stuff. We're blessed to be a region flushed with local farmers and mm-hmm. farms. Sure. Has this been a boon to Long Island Cares? Well, it's been a boon to Long Island Cares, of course, and all the pantries that we support. You know, we are very fortunate that not only do we have an agricultural community on Long Island with the farmers, but we also have this amazing uh, fishing community. Yes. You know, and during the pandemic, uh, they were really getting hurt, the Long Island fishermen. And we made it our business with the additional uh, state funding that we received through the Nourish New York program to invest about a quarter of a million dollars uh, into the fishing community. And we're still doing it today with the Nourish New York program. We're supporting Long Island fishermen. We're supporting Long Island farmers. Uh, You know, we always, when it comes to purchasing fresh produce, we we prefer to, you know, buy New York and, of course, buy Long Island. And it's symbiotic, too, because remember we had that sort of breakdown uh, through the pandemic as far as uh, being able to get enough food mm-hmm. out to the island. Yeah. The supply chain issues that we saw during COVID uh, certainly impacted us. You know, we place an order for food and usually within five to seven business days, the truck arrives during COVID, we were looking at 12-week backlogs because Crazy. what people didn't realize is that Long Island Cares and the Harry Chapin Regional Food Bank purchases the majority of our food, and we purchase it on the open market. So the same price the supermarket is paying for a truckload of you know lettuce, we're paying the same thing. Wow. And of course, the price has jumped yes. because of the pandemic, because everyone was having uh, challenges with the supply chain and getting things delivered on time. The good news during the pandemic is that Long Islanders really responded to the need, uh, in addition to the many businesses and corporations that have supported us over the four decades that we've been in business. So the issue of having the resources, the money, to bring the food to Long Island, that wasn't an issue. The issue was the time delay for us. You mentioned Harry Chapin. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about Harry's legacy a bit and the founding of the food bank in 1980? That would be my pleasure. (laughs) You know, (laughs) Harry, you know, Harry passed away at 38 years old. But during his career in the 70s, he was the voice in America talking about hunger. He influenced so many people from Bob Geldof to uh, Willie Nelson to Lionel Richie. Uh, You know, he is credited. People don't realize this. He's credited as being the uh, spark that ignited the USA for Africa movement and the song We Are the World. Uh, Harry not only called attention to the issue of hunger and food insecurity in the country, but he did something about it. He established two organizations. The first was World Hunger Years, 
which is now known as Why Hunger, and the second was Long Island Cares. And, you know, of the concert dates that he played during the year, which were approximately 220 concerts, half of them were done as fundraisers for charity, and the other half was done to support his family. And you look back 43 years now and realize that this 38-year-old musician from Long Island has a legacy that has far uh, outlasted uh, his age and years. Right. And, you know, Long Island Cares is part of that legacy. Uh, Harry really believed that the only way you can solve food insecurity was lifting people out of the cycle of poverty, giving them affordable housing, good-paying jobs, and adequate health care. Beautiful, beautiful We're still human struggling being. with that. Right. <laughs> All right, last question is for you, Paul. How did you come to the work? Well, I actually knew of Long Island Cares when it opened up in 1980. You know, as a social worker, I was working in the nonprofit community uh, and saw the story about Harry Chapin. I knew who he was. I had never met him. Uh, But so I was familiar with Long Island Cares. But then in 2008, when our former executive director retired, uh, the board of directors did a national search for a new executive director, and uh, I was interviewed five times. <laughs> Finally, after all the interviews, I was offered the position. Uh, I had ideas. I had two passions in my life. One was for helping people, and the other one was music. And I don't know anyone as fortunate as me that can take his two passions and bring them together uh, and then redefine what a food bank can do because I think in in the scheme of things in the Feeding America Network, Long Island Cares is really the exception to the rule. There are so many things that we do that other food banks uh, haven't done, the satellite programs, the freestanding pet pantry, some of the advocacy work that we're doing, uh, the fact that we we have more than 100,000 followers on social media and all through the platforms. Uh, So we've grown the organization. Uh, When I came in 2008, we had 35 staff people. We now have 75. Wow. Our budget was $8.5 million. It's now $36 million. Uh, And the one thing that stays constant is Long Island's fondness for this organization. Uh, Many people have called it historical because we were the first organization Uh, on Long Island to address the issue of hunger and food insecurity. And here we are, 43 years later, still doing the same thing. You can visit licares.org for more information. I'm Gianna Volpe, and that was Paul Pachter, President and CEO of Long Island Cares, the Harry Chapin Food Bank, for our In Conversation on Food Insecurity here on WLIWFM. We turn now to Holly Reichert Wheaton, who helms the food pantry in her hometown of Springs on Long Island's East End. Welcome, Holly. Thank you. Nice to be here. Let's start by talking about your mother, Betty, (laughs) and experiences uh, that led to the beginning of the Springs Food Pantry in 1992. Well, my mom was one of the original founders. Uh, She and a group of ladies were sitting in church one day, the Springs Church, in the congregation, looked around and saw some fishermen and some farmers who were in trouble. So they got together and just started going door to door and collecting food and handing it out. It's a beautiful thing. What happened six years after that? (laughs) Uh, I returned home from a job stint in Chicago And I was chatting with my mom, and uh, she said to me, you know, we can no longer just go door to door. The numbers are growing. So she says, we actually ordered food uh, from a purveyor, and she says, it's getting delivered next week, and I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. So I sent out a fundraising letter for her, uh, and that was within two weeks, and I just joined the ranks and have been there ever since. You talked about numbers growing. Can you comment on the exponential nature in which need increased throughout uh, the pandemic, and not only the pandemic, but uh, increased inflationary period afterward? 
it's my understanding provisions increased uh, or, or or numbers of, of people served or families served from 50 to 150 families in a matter of, what, a couple weeks at some point? Well, it even got to be more than that. Uh, we basically quadrupled within the first year. Um, we were serving an average of, in 2019, we were serving an average of about 55 families, about 150 people. And then the pandemic reared its ugly head. And we went from 55 families to about 250 families. We were upwards of 300 at some point um, and over 1,300 people. Unbelievable. All right, so let's talk about how people like John Bon Jovi and his wife, Dorothea, fit into the story of Springs Food Pantry's ability to keep up with the growing demand uh, through this time. They saved us. They literally saved us. Uh, Pandemic hit. People are gracious. Money's flowing in. um, But I couldn't get the food. Our food bank wasn't coming out here. They weren't delivering because they were out of supply as well. It became a supply and demand problem. And we were literally going to grocery stores and cleaning off shelves so that we could feed these people. And I don't mean the little grocery stores in East Hampton. We were going up island to to try and get as much food product that we, we could. And that was with our volunteers' help. You know, they all got in their cars and we just took off in different directions. Um, And then... Mr. Bon uh, Bon Jovi came in and he did a survey um, with uh, one of the people from Island Harvest who had, uh, he was very friendly with, and they came through and sat down with us and chatted and saw that we definitely had a need and what what was happening to us. And they set up a food bank at um, the clubhouse and we would go every Tuesday morning and pick up a dump truck, not a pickup truck, wow. a dump truck full of food. Ronald Webb Builders um, lent us the dump truck and three guys. And every Tuesday morning, we went there and picked up. And didn't you use the pews of a church? We did. We used the because we are housed in the church in Springs. And um, we, we don't have any storage, but right. we were getting a dump truck full of food. And of course, when the Seoul uh, Food Bank or, you know, the Seoul Food uh, Soul Kitchen. Uh-huh. When they left, they left behind some fr- refrigerated units for you? They, they, um, I, they knew I was in need of another refrigerator, a big one. So they called me in and said, take your pick. Um, you know, it's yours. So we, we did that. Plus, they gave us extra food at the end that was left over. Um, they just came in and said, you know, whatever, whatever you need, um, we'll put aside. And that's what they did for us. Speaking of need, we're doing uh, this interview, or we did this interview, if you're listening, in the future, in the summer of 2023, uh, where are the numbers as they stand? Uh, We're still averaging about 275 families um, and about 1,100 to 1,200 people a week. Um, Inflation just hit them. I mean, we got through the pandemic, um, but... The inflationary costs, housing costs alone. I mean, these people are paying five thousand dollars a month rent for and, a two bedroom, you know, one and a half bath. And some of these people are people who have lived here for generations, and it's every year becoming increasingly more difficult to stay. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're living. You know, Springs is made up of tradespeople. I don't know if everyone's aware of that, but it, they're the landscapers. You know, the construction workers, the painters, the irrigation guys, you know, the caregivers, the caretakers, and they're living paycheck to paycheck. You know, they make just above minimum wage. So how do you pay that amount of money? You don't. You can't. Can you talk about the cost to uh, running an organization like yours and uh, how it continues to exist and to grow (laughs) along with the need? So right now it's costing us um, close to $20,000 a week for our Wednesday distribution. And so our budget is about a million one at this point. Uh, you add in our housing costs and our utilities. Um, there's no paid employees at the Springs Food Pantry. We're all volunteer. You know, it's just, it is, it blows people away when you, when you think about the amount of food that 
we give to satisfy, and we are only giving three meals per day for three days. That's nine meals that we give to every family member, you know, um, and if you look at it and we put it all out on a table, it really doesn't look like a lot. You know, it really does not. But the just the inflation cost alone of everything is very hard to sustain, very hard. We fundraise 24-7. Can you talk about the feeling of giving? It gives me goosebumps. Um, no one is ever judged. I mean, you can't judge anybody because you just don't know. You just don't know their circumstances. The success stories are what I love. We had one, we re-register our recipients every year. I mean, they have to come in, prove that they live in Springs, and their proof of residency can be anything from a lease uh, to a letter from the landlord to a utility bill, anything like that. And this past year, this lady came in, a recipient came in, and she says, I did it, I did it, I did it. And she slams this piece of paper down on the desk in front of me as we're doing the re-registration. It's a tax bill. She bought her house. Oh, my God. And she said, without you, I could not have oh done that. Oh, my God. And so you don't, and you don't ask anyone to prove need, no. for example. No, we're a mission of the Springs Church, and so we would not ask that question. If they're there, they're there for a reason. Right. I mean, they really are. If you saw the lines at night on Wednesday night, some of them wait for an hour. You were telling me that it goes, how, how far does the line go? It will start at the Springs Church on Old Stone Highway and wrap around to the Springs School. Um, so it's a good, it's probably a half a mile that the line just goes. And we have volunteers that stay in the lot to move the traffic, you know. Um, and we have, at this point, um, we have TCO officers who come down to also help direct traffic. So we can get them in and get them out as fast as we can. I can't thank you and the volunteers quite enough for what you do. Can you uh, comment a moment about your volunteers and, and what, it, what it means for them and what it has provided them in addition to uh, the recipients? Our volunteers are incredible. As I said, no one gets paid. It is volunteer. And they, we call them on a moment's notice. Um, it takes about 35 volunteers to get us through a Wednesday distribution. We have about a, a roster of about 75 that we pull from because we want to give everybody a chance because everybody wants to volunteer. Um, and they and they want to do more. They want to do more. Uh, you know, the space is only so big, so we can't get everybody in there at one time. But um, they really, really enjoy it. They look forward to it. They've made friends with one another. You know, they go to the dog park together. They go out for dinner together. They might go to the, uh, a movie. So it's kind of fun to see those relationships evolve as well. And the volunteers also make friends with our recipients. I mean, they see them, you know, week after week. It's not the same people that come every week, but probably by once a month or once every three weeks, you'll start seeing the same people come in. And uh, they recognize each other. You know, and they'll see them in passing. Or we might see them at, at their job because they're all working. Right. It's just they can't make enough money. Oh, and it's such a small universe out here. Mm -hmm. Food insecurity, undeniably a huge, huge issue, especially here on the island. But it's beautiful to see a community of giving and a, and a culture of caring Absolutely. for Absolutely. and about one another. Uh, springsfoodpantry.com for more information and to learn how to give if interested. Absolutely. Absolutely. Holly Wheaton, an honor to have had you into the studio with us. Thank you. This was In Conversation on Long Island's only local NPR radio station, WLIWFM. I'm Gianna Volpe, and that was Holly Wheaton. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of WLIWFM In Conversation, our special program that brings you dynamic voices from across our region and beyond. 